Good stuff. If you have your Bibles today, turn to the book of Psalm. A couple of weeks ago, we started the sermon series that we've called Dedication. And if you've watched TV at all over the last several months, you've seen this uh, ad campaign that has gone out uh, through the Ad Council and, and uh, a lot of other uh, organizations that they've, they've uh, just done, a, I, I think, a wonderful job of, of uh, displaying how dads need to be there for their children, how they need to be more involved in their lives. And, and even though I feel like they've done a wonderful job with that, they fall a little short in what they are saying because they're not mentioning at all the important part that God plays in being a father of dedication. And so we felt it was necessary to preach this series. Uh, Kendall did a great job the last couple of weeks. We were able to watch online, did a great job uh, talking about biblical uh, fatherhood, and, and uh, he did such a good job. I, thought, I felt like I needed to step my game up a little bit this morning because uh, he did such a wonderful job. I know he, he got some stuff from Jensen Franklin and preached that, and that was really good, so I thought I need to step my game up. So I got some Bob Russell stuff I want to share with you this morning uh, that I think is really, really solid stuff that... Um, uh, I know is, is going to just challenge us today, not just as fathers, but as, uh, as mothers, as, as wives, as husbands, as brothers, as sisters, just as a child of God, I think this is going to, to help us. And so we've created our own version of dedication and taking a look at biblical fatherhood, and this is what I think we need to do this week uh, and in the weeks ahead to go down this road of dedication. Or go down this road of being a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. And so, if you have your Bibles, again, we're going to be in Psalm chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow along on the screen. And the first step on the road to dedication is this. And this is very elementary, and you're going to say, Ron, you, did you really need to tell us this? Um, I think so. I think we need those reminders. You know, you, you just feel like sometimes you hear something so often and it becomes so, I guess, rote. It just becomes this ritual for you that, that you forget that we need to live under the authority of our Heavenly Father. That's the first thing. I think we take that for granted. I think sometimes we say it, we talk a good game, but then when it comes to really getting off of our own uh, thrones that we've created in our world, uh, we, we, we fail to allow God to take his rightful place on the throne of our lives. And so I think that's the first step on this road. Live under the authority of our Heavenly Father. The first two verses of the book of Psalms say, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand around with sinners, or join in with the mockers. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. And so you don't have to be a rocket scientist to look around today and figure out that there are two worldviews that are out there, and they are competing against one another. And, and it's more than just a competition. They are going head to head. They are flat out going after it. These two worldviews, right? On one hand, you've got the world that's doing everything that it can possibly do to drag you into its system and get you to live by its standards. And on the other hand, you have God through his holy word who's trying to get you to live your life according to his standards that have been set forth in the Bible. For instance, when someone says, I believe that homosexuality is a sin and that can be repented of that and you can be forgiven of that, because the Bible says that. If you say you believe that, then the world is going to rise up against that and going to say, you're a bigot. You hate people. You're intolerant. Because these two worldviews are conflicting. They are butting heads with one another. The world counsels that you are here by accident. That you are a... a chain in the link of evolution and nothing really matters except the physical that's going on and your personal desires. So you do everything that you can possibly do to fulfill those things. And so you're free because of that to determine what is right and wrong for your life. That's an individual choice. Don't let anybody else impose those values on you. And when you die, there's not really a heaven and there's not really a hell. You just cease to exist. But the counsel of the Word of God says that you're here by God's creation and that you are here on purpose, that God created you. And before you ever got here, He knew you. And He has a plan and He has a purpose for your life. And what really matters are those things that are unseen, the things that are of the Spirit. 
And so ultimately, you are accountable to God and obeying His commands. That's what His Word says to us. And so instead of mocking God's law like the world does, a man of biblical dedication or a woman who is trying to live out her life, living up to God's standard, not only meditates on God's law, but this passage of Scripture says we delight in it. Do you ever, have you ever read Scripture, you read, read something in the Bible, and you're just like, man, I wish that wasn't there. Has anybody ever been there, right? The Word of God says you delight in those things that are in God's Word. And that hit me like a ton of bricks recently. You know, because there's some things in the Bible that I wish God had not clearly pointed out. The world would be probably a little bit more peaceful right now. But that's not the way that it is. He has given us this blueprint for having a content life, for having a happy life. The psalmist said, those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. I think that's why there's such a lack of peace in our world today, because people are living by their own standards and not God's standards. And so these two sources of authority, the world pulling you into their system and God wanting you to read his word, they are at war with one another and they give contradictory advice to our dads. On one hand, the world will tell you your child is dispensable. If you don't want that child, go ahead and abort it. It's okay. But the Word of God counsels that life is formed in the mother's womb and we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Who are you going to listen to? The world counsels you that children are, they can be a financial burden. Well, that, that's true. They can be a financial burden. But the world will say limit yourself to the number of kids you, you have and, and, you know, and, and if, if, if it's not, uh, if it doesn't fit into your budget and you accidentally just find yourself with an unexpected pregnancy, just terminate it. Don't worry about it. Or just limit yourself and don't even, you know, go there. But Psalm 127, 3 through 5, children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from Him. So remember that, moms, dads, next time you're about ready to, you know, Yank one of them. They're they're a reward. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers at the city gates. The world says, don't try to impose your values on your child. You'll turn them off. Let them choose for themselves. Eventually, they're going to figure it out. They're going to choose what's right and wrong. That's what the world says. But God's word says, a child left to himself disgraces his mother. Discipline your son and he'll give you peace and he'll, del- he'll bring delight to your soul. The world says, don't spank your kids. I wish they were saying that back in the 70s. They weren't saying that much back in the 70s. I wish they... Don't spank your child. That teaches violence. That's abuse. But God's word says, he who spares the rod hates his son. He who loves him is careful to discipline him. The world counsels you. The government is ultimately responsible for your child. We'll determine what your child should be learning in school. We'll determine whether it's right or wrong for your child to come to school as one gender and then go into a bathroom and change their clothes and go to class as another gender and then after school's over, go back to that room, change back into those clothes and go home and mom and dad never finds out. Let the government decide that for you. It's what the world says, but Ephesians 6 says, Fathers, bring your children up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. And so dads, if you're sitting out there, and I know we're three weeks past Father's Day, sorry, you need this today. We've got to be an example to our children, and we've got to be an example of joy. It's not that we follow God's mandates because we just want to be religious. It's because it's the best way for us. And the Bible says that's when you'll truly find joy. That's when you'll truly find contentment, when you follow what God's Word is saying for your life. That's why the psalmist said, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand with the sinners or join in with the mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Now, if a man wants to be a godly man of dedication, other members of the family have got to be supportive as well. Because I've seen this happen before. I've genuinely seen 
men who want to do a better job of living their lives for Jesus Christ, but they're not getting a lot of support from home. And it, 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 believe me, it happens. I've seen it. They're not, they're not getting it from their, their wife. They're not getting it from their kids. And so I encourage you, wife and kids, if you see your husband, you see your dad doing his best to live out godly principles in his life and for your family, you support that. Teenagers, let's just say you ask your dad for permission to go out on the weekend with some of your friends and your dad says, well, I don't really trust your friends and I don't think there's enough adult supervision. You can't go. What's your reaction? Oh, he's so strict. Can't believe that. But you just don't trust me. You hate me, don't you? Then you go in your room and you pout and you stamp and you snort and you slam the door and 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 you just you just don't support that decision at all. Your 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 dad knocks on the door, comes and tries to make peace, and you tell him to just go away. I don't ever want to see you for the rest of my life. It's gonna make your life miserable. Right? Some of you are smiling because you've done that or you've witnessed them doing that, right? And, and your goal is to make your, your dad's life miserable at that particular time. Maybe, maybe that is your intent, I don't know. But the Bible says, listen, catch this, kids. You will reap what you sow. So, if you're sitting out there as an adult today, and you see your kids acting in a way that you don't like, you might be reaping what you sow. Think about your uh, teenage years, right? I don't know. It can happen. Those of you with unruly teenagers right now, think back to what you were like. You know, if you're a teen, you have a responsibility to live under God's authority as well. Ephesians 6, and this is great. Ephesians 6, and I love this, and Macy was sharing this with us the other day. Avit, my grandson, y'all heard about him before once or twice, I know. Um, he already knows this verse, the concept of this verse. You know, it's not word for word, and it's changed a little bit to fit his vocabulary, but he knows the meaning of this verse. Doesn't always do it, but he knows the meaning, right? Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and, if, and you will have a long life on this earth. So let's go back to that scenario for a minute. Let's say you ask your parents for permission. You ask your dad for permission to go out with your friends. And he says, no, I don't really trust your friends, and I don't think there's enough adult supervision. And you respond by saying, well, dad, thanks for caring about me. I understand. I'll go along with whatever you say. What's going to happen? I mean, after he gets up off the floor. What's going to happen? <laughs> you get out of the emergency room for being treated for a heart attack. What's going to happen then, Right? The next time you ask, Dad, can I go? He's going to say, sure, your attitude's been so great. Here's $500, enjoy the whole week. No, he's not going to do that. But, but he's, he might say something like, you know, listen, okay, you know what, you responded well the last time. I'm going to give you a little bit more leash this time, maybe a little bit more the next time. The Bible says that it'll go well with you if you obey your parents, if you obey your, it's going to go well with you. You might not like it at the time, but it's going to go well with you. Proverbs 13, 1 says, a wise child accepts his father's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. And wives, buckle up. If you have a husband who seeks to be a godly man of dedication, it's important that you be reinforcing of that and you be supportive of that. Ephesians 5.33, the wife must respect her husband. And it, it, it creates quite a stir these days whenever we bring up this passage of Scripture that says, wives, submit to your husbands. We don't like that, do we? Oh, I'm not, oh, no, I can't believe this day and age, we don't have to. Counselors of this world, sometimes they go crazy over the idea, and they suggest that men who believe this way, well, these men, they're just, you know, they're just, they're just, they just want to keep their women barefoot and pregnant and in the kitchen all the time, and, and, and they're just cavemen, and they just want to drag us around by their hair and just tell us what to do and so on and so forth. But the biblical principle of leadership and submission is best illustrated when you look at Jesus Christ. Philippians 2 says Christ was equal with God. Okay, so let's just 
pause right there. Women, you are equal. We are all equals, right? And so Christ was equal with God, but here's what Christ chose to do. He chose to humble himself and become submissive to the Father, saying, not my will, but your will be done. He even went to the cross for the salvation of the family, and far beyond anything that was degrading or hateful, that was Jesus' greatest honor. And we praise him for that. And God gave him the name that is above every other name. And when we look at this passage of scripture, let this remind you that we need to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Not just women, but men as well, to submit yourself to the will of God. We are all called upon to be submissive in different spheres, aren't we? Everything that we do, we're called to be submissive to someone. As Christians, we're called to be submissive to the authorities of the government. Whether we like what they're doing or not, we need to be submissive to them. That doesn't mean we go along with everything. That doesn't mean that we agree with everything. And that means that we can, you know, that's one of the beautiful things about our country, that we can vote them out if we want to. But once they're in office, the Bible says we're submissive to them. Children, we're called to be submissive to our parents. At work, we're called to be submissive to our boss. In church, we're called to be submissive to the elders. If anyone says, I'm not going to be submissive to the elders, they're, they're just not doing what I think they ought to do. Well, then that's arrogance. And that's a sin. And you need to repent of that. It's unbiblical. And I'm not saying you've got to agree with everything that they say because I, I know I don't. You know, there's times when we don't agree on things, but we're still submissive. Everybody's accountable to someone, so I need to be submissive to the elders. That doesn't necessarily mean they're superior or they know more of the Bible. I just know that within the sphere of the church, in order to have order, my place is to be submissive. God has given us a structure, and that's what I see when I see husbands and wives. God has given us this structure. Wives, you be submissive. Husbands, don't take advantage of that. You be loving leaders. That's not degrading. That's not hateful. That's the Bible. It's just acknowledging that in the most important sphere of our lives, the home, God has set up an order, right? Right? When there's no mutual consensus, when you can't come to an agreement, someone's got to take the lead and say, this is the way it's going to be. I know when Stacy and I, when we got married, we agreed that in our marriage, she would make all the small decisions and I would make all the big ones. And in almost 30 years of marriage, nothing big has come up. Um, just, no, just, <laughs> just no. Anyway. I love this picture. We, we guys, you know, sometimes we need a little help. Amen? Amen. All right. I love this picture. I recently saw it on Twitter. It says this. Husbands choosing colors must have notes from their wives. That's about truth, isn't it? Right? That's logical. Now, my brother, yeah, a lot of you know my brother, Jeff. He has a double whammy. Not only is he a husband, but he's colorblind. And uh, so he has absolutely no business whatsoever uh, of... Uh, of ever picking out paint colors. He, it, he had to learn, actually, because he can't see the colors of a stoplight. And someone asked him one time, how do you stop? He said, well, I know red's on top and yellow's in the middle and green's on the bottom. First time he went to Indianapolis and they had sideways <laughs> stoplights, <laughs> he about ran a red light. He didn't know. He didn't know which one to stop at. True story. Bless his heart. But listen to me, church. If you... If you choose not to live under the umbrella of God's authority, if you choose not to live under what he has decided is the best, you have two options. One, you can refuse to get married. Because <laughs> nowhere in the Bible does it say, women, you submit to all men. It doesn't say that. A lot of people would like to point to that and say that it says that, but it doesn't say that. Deborah was a judge over Israel, the men of Israel. and The men were to be submissive to her in her leadership role. If you don't want to have leadership by a man in your home, don't get married. Stay single. That's what I do. Second option, choose not to have a biblical marriage. The world has a different mindset. Right? The people of the world establish their own rules. You don't have to live by that, is what they say. 
So you have the right. You can choose the counsel of God or the counsel of the world. Choice is up to you. But I want to tell you, there's millions of Christian husbands and wives who will tell you that when you honor God's word in the home, it works. It just works. If the husband and the father, the mother and the wife, if they all honor the word of God and the children are honoring the word of God and honoring their parents, there's a joy in a home like you won't find in any other kind of home. I can point you to scores and scores and scores of people who grew up in homes who had absolutely everything materialistic. But we're absolutely miserable. Second step on the road to godly dedication is to provide security for those under his care. Verses 3 and 4 says, They're like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season. Their, lot, their leaves never wither and they prosper in all they do, but not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. In other words, a, a man of dedication is consistent. A man of dedication is dependable. Day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out. There's consistency there. Not so with the wicked, the Bible says. They're like chaff, and the wind comes and blows it away. Now, one of the most important needs of children is a sense of stability in the home. Our world is so unstable Would you agree with me on that? And the home needs to be a shelter in this time of instability, in this stormy season of our world. The home needs to be a shelter. In this first sermon of the series, Kendall was preaching about um, the statistics of young people in this country that are growing up without fathers present in the home. Absolutely disheartening to hear those numbers. But then you look around and you see the kind of shape that our world's in. It's not surprising because children need that stability. And dads, it needs to come from you, right? And you provide that by, first of all, supplying the physical needs of your family without complaint. First Timothy 5, 8, but those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. You say, well, I provide for my family, but yeah, do you do it without complaining? You know, I, I've heard some people come in and, and, you know, well, I work hard to put food on the table. Like, oh, don't, don't go there, dads. It's not necessary, Right? We know. We see what you're doing. Fathers, you have a responsibility to provide the necessities of your home. That doesn't mean you have to be an executive in a Fortune 500 company. Right? You don't have to be a millionaire. You just just do what you need to do to provide for your children. If you earn money honestly, you manage your money wisely, you share your money more generously, your kids are going to see that. And there's going to be a stability there for them because you do that. How many times have you heard people of the past generation say, you know, we grew up poor, but we didn't know it. How many of you have heard that? How many of you are that way? Why? Why? Because there was a dad who just did what he needed to do without complaint, provided the basic needs. Didn't even know you were poor. There were times when, I, I, I tell you, we were poor. We were really, really poor. I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, but first five years of my life, I had to go to an outhouse. Am I preaching to anyone else here this morning? Right? And if it was night, whoo, I wasn't going to that outhouse at night by myself at four, you know, four or five years old. So we had a bucket on the back porch. We'd have cocoa wheats for dinner. I thought it was a treat because it was chocolate. I didn't know it was all we could afford. Now why could I grow up that way and not even realize that we were dirt poor? Because I had a dad who worked his tail off without complaint and provided that stability. And he did it with 
The second thing too, consistent behavior. He was who he was at work. He was who he was at church. He was who he was at home. 1 Timothy 4, 16, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. In other words, make sure there's a consistency between your walk and your talk. Some of you can remember a time when you discovered there was a part of your dad's life that was contrary to what he said he believed. Kind of rocked your world a little bit, didn't it? In an uncertain world, children need the stability, the consistency of a father who's like a tree planted by the water. Third way you provide security to your children is by consistent and reasonable discipline. Ted Engstrom defines integrity as doing what you say you're going to do. That means if you tell your child, I'm going to count to three, and if you get to three and you don't do what you said you were going to do at three, then they're going to see that, right? How many times have you ever been in Walmart? I'm going to count to three. One, two, two and a half. Two and three court, they never get to three. Like, I just one time I want to see a mom get to three and just see what happens. And you don't see it, right? And if you say you're going to do something, you know, your kid is in church and they're kicking the seat in front of you. And you say, if you don't stop kicking the seat in front of you, you and me is going to go out in the hallway and it's not going to end well. Back it up. You tell your daughter, you're not dating until you're 35. <laughs> All right, we'll back it up a little bit. 16, I know, I don't have daughters, I can say this. 16, let's just say 15. She's 15 and she meets somebody that's really, really awesome. Even you like them. You think they're great. But you said, you know, no, we're not doing that until you're 16. There there is a consistent, there's a stability there in knowing that mom and dad mean what they say and they're going to back it up. They're going to do what they said they're going to do. You're training your child to respect what you say. And that you're going to back up what you say you're going to do. And then, most importantly, you provide security by unconditional love. Our kids are involved in so many other things, right? There's a lot of different people in their lives. Like, for instance, they may play on a sports team and their coach may love them if they win. And their teacher may love them in school if they excel. And their peers may love them if they're funny or they're attractive. But as a father, you love them whether they're on the bench or they're on the all-star team. Whether they make A's or D's. Whether they're beautiful or ordinary. Whether they're poised or awkward. Dad, the Bible says love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You love your children like that. Now, ladies, if you have a husband or a father who provides that kind of security, you be supportive. Don't compare them to other dads. I've counseled men before who've come into my office and they've said things like, well, you know, my wife's always comparing me to to this guy or or whatever, or what this family's doing or what they have or whatever. Now, don't, don't do that. Don't compare them to other dads who make more money, you know? Don't gripe about the discipline that they're trying to help bring maturity in your kids through. Don't pull away from his expressions of love or laugh that he's just some sentimental old sap now. Maybe once in a while, you ought to just say, kids, you know what? Hey, uh, kids, you ought to say this maybe. Dad, you're, you're like a tree planted by the water. You're dependable. I appreciate that. I wish like crazy. I had the opportunity to say that to my dad right now. Don't put it off. Let them know how much you appreciate what they're doing for them. Here's the third and final thing. Prepare your family for eternity. Verses 5 and 6. Actually, I want to back up to 4. He's talking about, you know, not the wicked because they're worthless and 
they're like chaff that's scattered by the wind, right? And he, and he goes on to say in verse 5, those that are scattered by the wind, they will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have a place among the, uh, no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked leads to destruction. Listen, dads, our greatest responsibility is not to teach them, hey, don't get in a car with a stranger. Don't take candy from, from a stranger. You know, you need to save more than you spend. You need to read the, the, the fine print. You need to buy the appropriate amount of insurance. You need to build your confidence. Those things are all good, but the most important thing, your primary responsibility to prepare your kids for the... Uh, they, they stand before God in judgment. That's, that's your most important thing. And, and I think you need to pause and ask yourself, are my kids going to meet me on the other side? And say, Dad, thanks. Thanks for introducing me to Jesus. Thank you for showing me the way to heaven. Or are they going to say, Dad, you know, I appreciate everything that you did for me in life, except <laughs> that ultimate contingency, which is meeting Jesus. Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world? In the process of that, forfeits his soul. I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up. And as they're coming, I want to share with you about a study that was done a few years back by a couple of sociologists in Southern California. Dr. Bingston and Dr. Acock, they completed one of the most extensive studies of the family that's ever been done. And they found that it's the father, not the mother, that most influences religious beliefs and church attendance and moral values. I don't know if you knew that or not, but here's what Dr. Bingston wrote. He said, we found to our surprise that in almost every area except religion, feelings about work, politics, marriage, economics, young people's attitudes most closely match those of their mother. But in the area of religion, the father's attitude prevailed. And I think that's why in Scripture... Almost every time when it talks about training your children to know the Lord, almost every time it'll say, now you fathers, you talk about these things when you walk along the way. You fathers, you bring up your children in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Man, that's a sobering fact, dads. When you think that the eternal destiny of your children is largely entrusted to us. It's not solely on us, but it's largely on us. That's why Bob Benson wrote, the family is just about the place I want to succeed the most. In fact, I can succeed here if I can. It might somehow atone for all the other failures in my whole life. Fathers, if you don't get anything else out of this whole series, your greatest responsibility is to teach your children to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what a man of dedication is. And kids, when your dad says, all right, you get to bed early tonight, we're going to church tomorrow, don't put up a fight. And you moms, you say, well, I'd really rather do this this weekend. If you've got a husband that's saying, no, I want to I wanna be in church, don't give him a hard time about being a religious nut or something. <laughs> You'd be there, right? And I'll speak of grandparents for just a moment. I can do that now. <laughs> I stayed away from it for years, but now I I think sometimes we have a tendency to second guess or maybe ignore what our grown children are doing. You know? And we forget that our grown children still want our approval. They still want our encouragement. They still want us to acknowledge what they're doing. It's amazing how we still want the approval of our parents no matter how old we are. I know I talk about this a lot with a buddy of mine from college. 
he's brought it up several times. He said, you know, when I played sports all throughout college, my dad never went to a single game. And it still just tears him up. I know when I would go home and visit my dad, there wasn't a time that, that I visited that before I left, he would say every time, dad, uh, Ronnie, I'm so, so proud of you. Yeah, that's about what I do sometimes. You know, I say, really? He said, again, you sappy old man, you know? No, um, it was great. Again, if I could just hear that again. I loved hearing that. And so if you find yourself with adult children, don't hesitate to let them know how proud you are.